in The Hidden Life of Trees, Peter Volenbin uncovered the mysterious social structures of our forests. In The Inner Life of Animals, he shed a light on the emotions and social interactions of animals, ranging from grieving deer to the regrets of rats. The Secret Wisdom of Nature, Trees, Animals, and the Extraordinary Balance of All Living Things finished the tr trilogy by examining how living creatures interact with one another and their impact on their environment. Combining his experience in scientific research, he explains how the delicate ecosystem functions, as well as how human interference can impact nature's complex balancing act. He has spent over 20 years working in forest management in Germany and has been publishing books on ecology with an emphasis on forest management since 2007. He now offers regular forest tours where he educates the public in what keeps the complex ecosystems functioning and healthy. Without further ado, here's our author. Good evening. Is it loud enough at first? No. Uh, just a moment. Okay, better? Louder? Should we make it louder? A little louder, better? It's okay? Yeah. Because otherwise I would have to shout and uh, I'm not used to that because usually I'm in a forest, not, not, uh, <laughs> I'm not talking to an audience and I'm also not talking to trees, just to say that. <laughs> Okay, so um, we will start with a non-tree thing. This is not a tree, <laughs> as you see. No, um, that's the Neanderthal man. And uh, the Neanderthal man is a good examp example for how we look at nature. Uh, since uh, 300 years, we, we look at nature uh, like as it is, if it is a big machine. And as if just uh, humans are able to feel emotions and to be intelligent and whatsoever. And uh, scientists made a ranking. Humans first, and then animals, higher animals, lower animals, higher plants, lower plants, for example. Trees rank higher than algae. And uh, the Neanderthal man is a very good example how scientists defended that until now. And that causes problems because we forget asking questions and we, are, we forget being curious because we think things are as scientists told us that they are. The Neanderthal man was um, detected in Germany near, near the city of Düsseldorf in a, in a small river valley called Neanderthal. And they found there uh, the first, uh, first um, uh, bones of the Neanderthal man and those bones were crooked. That was very good that, that, that they were crooked. That was a sick example, as it turns out later. But uh, with crooked bones, you could reconstruct the Neanderthal man uh, as if it was an ape. And uh, yeah, as you, when you uh, see all drawings of the Neanderthal man, it looks like a chimpanzee. Uh, then they researched the brain volume. And then, uh, oops, it turns out that the brain volume is, on average, a little bit more than ours. Okay, that's a problem with the ranking, but oh, uh, wait, there's an explanation. Uh, the Neanderthal man uh, had a lot of muscles, and the brain was responsible for steering all those muscles, and there was just a little left for intelligence. But the problem is, uh, what about modern bodybuilders? Uh, <laughs> Is there anyone? <laughs> so, uh, okay, there's this explanation, is there, you can read it up to now, that uh, that's just because of the muscles, that the brain has to be a little bit bigger. Okay, um, the next thing they discovered um, were uh, tongue bones in Israel. Tongue bones from the Neanderthal men. A tongue bone is uh, in your tongue, a little bone, which is just there for uh, the ability of speaking. For example, chimpanzees doesn't have a tongue bone. <laughs> the next problem. Um, up to now, scientists say, uh, ah, okay, the, the Neanderthal man has had the ability to speak, but if he really spoke, we don't know. Uh, therefore, you could also say, uh, okay, they detected eye holes in the skull, so the Neanderthal man had eyes, but if he really could see, we don't know. That would be the same. Um, the next thing. Um, um, the Neanderthal man was regarded less intelligent uh, than we are, so uh, they found drawings of the Neanderthal man with, which uh, matches uh, perfect to that. Uh, I don't know if you know them. Uh, they were detected in uh, near Gibraltar in a, in a cave, and they looked like a hashtag sign. 
And that they were regarded to be the best art a Neanderthal man was able to. Uh, a hashtag sign. Okay, that's okay. The distance is big enough. And then uh, they researched wonderful cave drawings with overblown hands and um, wild cattle and abstract, even abstract art in southern Spain in the cave. And they, they researched the age of the pigments used for this painting. And then they found out these pigments were as old as 66,000 years. And at that time, they were just Neanderthal men in southern Spain. Ugh. The last uh, thing, the last border line was um, that scientists said uh, Neanderthal men never mix with a modern human. Never. And as, as you have read it for sure, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, this, this, this went down and down from 1% of the genes to 2 now up to 4.5% of genes of the modern European, or if your ancestors are from Europe anyway, uh, uh, around about 4.5% 4, 4 of the genes are from Neanderthal men. And you can judge if your ancestors were Neanderthal men uh, by skin color, white skin color, blue eyes, or if you smoke, or if you drink alcohol, uh, that's, yeah, that, if you like that, that's from Neanderthal man. Or depression, that's perhaps not so nice. Uh, uh, that's Neanderthal man. So um, many of us bear Neanderthal genes, and uh, that means also that the Neanderthal man has, had never been extinct. It's still in here. When I look around, <laughs> or look at me, <laughs> it's, he's still there, or she's still there. Um, and for me, that's a good, good ex example how, how we look at nature as, uh, as a ranking. And that makes seen biological uh, scene or scientifically seen no sense. We, we, uh, we uh, can regard us more important than, for example, elephants or trees or so. That's okay. But uh, uh, why should we keep other species in distance? I, st I don't see any reason. Here we have another another example of uh, how nature works. Uh, here you see a uh, natural spruce forest in northern northern Sweden. By nature, uh, there is a lack of nitrogen. Nitrogen is the most important fertilizer uh, in nature, um, but uh, in general, uh, you find it very rare in the in the soil. It's um, in the air. We have a lot of nitrogen, but uh, there we need to have special molecules. Uh, so that the plants can use them for growing. And um, uh, those molecules, they will be produced during uh, heat processes like fires, like volcano outbreaks, like, or uh, through special bacteria processes. Um, but in general, uh, nitrogen is very rare in nature, but um, in many cases in ancient times, it came from fish which, are, which uh, went into trees. But they they didn't didn't spring into the trees, <laughs> that that then they should have got uh, uh, head head pain. No, uh, we have a, had a special process, and this was was the guy who who made the fish come into the trees. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, bears are feeding on on salmon, for example, and uh, when the stomach is full, from time to time you have to go behind a tree. <laughs> And there it is, the fertilizer. <laughs> Could express it a little bit uh, different, but I think that's the best way. So that's the way how salmons are, are coming into trees. And when you um, research old trees along river sides, uh, then uh, up to 80% of the nitrogen in old spruce trees, for example, uh, are from salmon. It's a special isotope from nitrogen, which is just found in the oceans. And uh, that's exactly how it works. Nowadays, um, here at the Potomac River, but also in, in Germany, uh, we don't have that process anymore. Uh, but we have the car industry. I don't know if you heard about Dieselgate. <laughs> oh it's from Germany. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> I've calculated what, the, what all the cars are doing. Um, I calculated it for Germany. When I want to compare it with, uh, with uh, big salmons uh, and per square kilometer and year, then the amount of the nitrogen coming from the car industry, because it's a burning process in the, in the engine, uh, is about uh, the same amount like uh, 
170,000 big salmons per square kilometer per year. That's coming from the car from the uh, cars. So the trees have a lot of nitrogen in the moment, and they are growing 30% faster than in ancient times, and that's not good for trees. You you might say, think, okay, so the timber uh, timber industry is happy now. <laughs> the quality of uh, of uh, the timber decreases, the trees get uh, weakened, and they won't live very long. They grow too fast because trees li love to grow very slow. For example, a little tree um, of this height in a, in a primeval forest is around about two or three hundred years old. The oldest tree in the, in the world that I visited was as high as this, this uh, room here. Uh, it's a, a spruce tree in northern Sweden. It's around about ten thousand years old and still living. Uh, so trees are very slow, and if we push them to grow, they they won't become very old. It's a little bit like in the industrial animal keeping, yeah, where pigs are forced to grow very fast. And if you bring such pigs in in an uh, animal keeping, um, then they will die very early. They become very big, but they die very early. So it's exactly the same on trees. So I would li uh, more like to have the process back to the old ways, like this year. But in Germany, we are a crowded country. The problem is uh, are, are the bears, not the salmon, <laughs> which are returning now. Okay, um, we're coming back to, to the way we look on nature. Here we have the European crane. And uh, we nowadays we don't say nature is a, is a machine. Perhaps I tell you a little story about uh, 200 years ago uh, of uh, Mr. Claude Bernard. I don't know if anyone uh, knows him. Claude Bernard, it's a French, French researcher in former times, and uh, he was the founder of modern uh, anatomy, and he nailed dogs on planks. Uh, and the dogs uh, were still living then. They cut them open, and the dogs screamed, and he said, ah, that means nothing. It's just like a machine, lack of oil. And that's how we, we regard uh, nature and, and even animals up to now. When you think about industrial animal keeping, it's a uh, it's a hard topic. And when we look at wild animals, we nowadays we don't say it's a machine. We, we say it's like a computer. It's driven by the genes. It's driven by a genetical code, like a genetical program, and that's nonsense. For example, when cranes are moving to the south, migrating in fall, uh, some scientists say, yeah, it's because of their genes. They have to fly to the south. I don't know what, what, what you're doing when you're going to Florida, for example. Is it in your genes? And you're going to the airport and say, oh, I have to, I have to move to Florida. <laughs> yeah, but, but many, many uh, scientists say, yeah, that's exactly what birds are doing. That's crazy. Why? They think, they think about what, what they do. They, for example, they think, OK, now that's, uh, I, I say it in, in easy words, but uh, that's research, for example, by Lithuanian uh, scientists. They found out that cranes talk about Okay, when should we fly? Should we take this route or this way or more easterly? Uh, what's the best way for this year? When should we start? For example, cranes are lazy. I don't know if uh, any one of you drives a bicycle. When you have the wind against you, that's not very nice. And cranes uh, don't like to fly against the wind, so they wait for a northern wind. And you can uh, say when the cranes, judge when the cranes are flying to the south, you get a heavy, cold northern wind. And therefore, they just uh, have to go move up into the air, and then they are driven by the wind uh, to to, uh, to Spain, without uh, very much uh, uh, exhaustion for them. So, uh, cranes are are talking about that. Uh, you see it sometimes that the last cranes are moving to the south in January, and the first are coming back in January, and perhaps they they made a, make a mistake, and then they they move again back south to Spain afterwards. That's like we are doing it, so there's no, no difference. Here we have another example how uh, nature works, and we don't think about it. Here is, uh, Washington is a perfect example for that. We have here a lot of street, uh, street lights burning uh, the whole night. And we say moths uh, are attracted by light, which is not true. They hate light. And you now perhaps you think, why, why do they fly to the street lights? It's because uh, um, in ancient times, there were no lights at night beside the moon. And when a moth tried to fly straight, in a straight direction, 
it thinks, okay, when I want to fly straight, I always have to keep the moon on the left side. Well, when the moon is always on the left side, I'm straight. When I, when I fly a, a, a bended way, uh, then the moon is behind me, or this, and when, so I have to correct it until it is on the left side. So now the moth passes a street light in a straight direction. It's, it's a completely correct straight dire direction, but suddenly the moon, the so thought moon, is behind the moth. And the moth thinks, okay, uh, I made a mistake. I uh, uh, went too much on the right, so I have to correct it to the left. And the moth, moth correct the way and fly uh, some, some yards further and say, oh, shit, the, the moon is uh, again behind me. So I made another mistake. So I've corrected uh, my way to the, to the left. And it's to left, to left, to left. And uh, suddenly the moth is uh, flying against the light. And it, it's not able for the moth to, to uh, go back from the light because in this case, the moon is behind the moth. And that's the problem why why uh, why those those uh, uh, that are is a sort of butterfly is not they are not able to uh, go back from the slide and we have another problem around this uh, street light or garden light which we think uh, are is for example when when you have that little garden light with solar cells we think wow that's environmentally friendly no it isn't because it's burning the whole night and around those those lights. Uh, the whole little ecosystem changes because you, uh, near this light you always have a very fat spider. <laughs> yeah. uh, this spider is really happy, but the rest of, the, of this little ecosystem isn't. Or you have um, bats hunting around those lights. Perhaps you see it here in Washington too. Yeah, through the night is wonderful for the bats, but it's not really good for the, for the moth. Um, therefore, if you don't need the light, switch it off. Here we have a bat, and bats are a very good example. Uh, it's, a, it's a rare bat, I don't know the, the English name for it, but it, it lives in old forest uh, with big stems, and in, uh, it lives in caves of the stems, um, so it's a very good indicator for uh, um, yeah, forests which are ecolo uh, ecological scene intact. And uh, this bat is a good example how we think that animals Th uh, see their their environment. How how does bat, uh, bats hunt? Pardon? Radar? Yeah, so, uh, something similar. So uh, sonar? Yeah, that means by voice. And we we explain it uh, that they are crying, and then then they hear the echo, like hello moth. Moth? Okay, it's in this direction. No, but it's a wrong imagination because, yeah, <laughs> I think a bat wouldn't be very efficient by hunting like this. Hello! Uh, and this time the moth uh, would be away. Uh, uh, I don't know how many pictures uh, we can differ per second. Do you know that? When watching a film? Yeah. Used to be 24, but nowadays with uh, with uh, HD TV, uh, it's we say 40. <laughs> I don't know if it is true, but uh, the quality seems to rise with technique. I don't know. Uh, wrong about that. Um, and do we know how often a bat cries? Uh, not cries, shout. Sorry. <laughs> hundred a hundred times per second. A hundred times per second. And uh, with that, um, a moth, uh, uh, um, a bat is able to see much, much sharper than we. But it, it, it's, uh, it sees with, with its ears. So we think it's, it's hearing what's going on. No, no, in its brain, it's, it's uh, getting a very sharp picture. It's able to detect even uh, things of, of the size of a hair. Uh, the only difference is uh, there are no colors. It's just black and white. That's the difference. But when we think about bats, we think about uh, that they are hunting with their ears. No, they have pictures in their brain like we have. It's just a different sort of wave. Okay, here you have a special thing. Uh, we think that insects are something stupid, driven by their genetic code. And perhaps they, are, they have uh, something like a super intelligence or so, uh, because they are a super organism. When you read about super organism, that's a sort of uh, bringing them on a lower uh, level because uh, being part of a superorganism like a brain means you are just a, a single cell, and single cells are not very intelligent. So, uh, talking about uh, 
being part of a super or organism is not very nice. Um, ants are related to bees, and we know about bees that bees are conscious. That's modern research, for example, from well-known universities in Berlin, for example. We know that bees are conscious. I don't know if you know uh, how bees are, are going to fly out to, to search flowers. We said before that they are programmed in their hive by a special dance. One, one bee uh, detected the flower field, for example, the sun, sunflower field, comes back and then this bee begins to dance and all other bees around it get this program. Ah, okay, two miles in this, this direction there's a sunflower field and then we can go out. Yeah, it's, it's a computer. But what will those bees do when the farmer, meanwhile, has cut the flower? Yeah, when they're all gone, the sunflowers, uh, then the, this bee would have to go back to the hive and get a new program. That would be stupid. And bees don't do that. They know, ah, mm -hmm, okay, the flowers are gone. Where are the other bees? In this direction. So I shorten the way and fly directly to the new field. Because the bee know where it is, who it is, uh, it knows about the, the, the landscape, it has a geographical mind, so it's not a single brain cell of a superorganism. And nor are the, the ants. The ants are um, keeping cattle like we do. This, this time that are lysis, which are sucking plant, plant liquids. Uh, those lysis, they, they don't like sugar. When you park your car under a tree with a lot of lysis, you have all those sugar sugar dots on your car, which are not nice for cleaning. But uh, the question is, why do um, lysis uh, bring out so much sugar? Because they are uh, they they like protein. They don't like sugar. They like protein. And in plants, we don't have very much protein. So uh, they bring out a lot of sugar. And sugar uh, is a good liquid. I don't know if you have ever eaten uh, forest honey. No. No, none of you had eaten forest honey. <laughs> that's funny. Yes, yes. And that's, uh, forest honey is very brown because it's from the back of those lices, right? <laughs> I don't know if, if the color therefore is brown, but uh, uh, and ants like that too. And they uh, drink as much as uh, a complete, uh, complete um, ant population drinks as much as 200 liters uh, a year. And they like to keep their cattle on special plants. But the lice is try to change the plants. And the ants prevent that by fencing them in. But they make it more intelligent than we do. They bring uh, out of their feet something like an uh, opiate. Yeah, around this place where the lice are, when the lice try to escape and cross this line, <laughs> they, they become stoned. So, <laughs> okay, oh, perhaps I stay. Uh, <laughs> Because that's a good place, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but the other possibility would be not to go over this fence, chemical fence, but fly away. They can, uh, um, lices are able to grow uh, wings. And if uh, lices are doing that, then uh, the ants are going uh, and cut the wings off. That's exactly what we do when we have free range goose. Uh, we cut their wings. So it's uh, the similar techniques uh, that are in use. Um, here we have a nice ecosystem, which you experience every morning, or evening, or whensoever. Uh, it's a groundwater. The groundwater under your feet, it's uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, ecosystems which is not very well detected so far and researched so far. It's, it goes as deep as, um, yeah, let's say, three miles, and processes, the deeper uh, uh, they come, uh, the slower they get. For example, bacteria, they, they part every 500 years. They are very slow down here, down under your, your feet. And uh, this groundwater ecosystem goes through all water tubes right to your tap. It's full of bacteria in the, in the tubes. Uh, there are little uh, animals which feed on bacteria. There are crabs which feed on these little animals which feed on bacteria. They are all there. Uh, and when you have a strange taste in your coffee in the morning, which, uh, which seems to be a little bit like seafood. That's not the brand of the coffee. <laughs> there are little crabs in your coffee. But there's a difference between um, the United States and um, Germany. There's a recent research uh, from the inner side of showerheads. It's also a special ecosystem. 
<laughs> Depends on. <laughs> no, they, it, it's really a special ecosystem. And there's a big difference between uh, German <laughs> shower heads and, and uh, American shower heads. Uh, in, in Germany, we have a rich uh, biodiversity inside, which doesn't s sounds very hygienic, but with which, with which it is. Uh, because with all the chlorine you have here in your water, we don't have that in Germany. We have other things uh, to bring uh, um, poisonous substances out. With all the chlorine in, in, in the water, it turns out that the dangerous bacteria stay in, but the rest of the ecosystem is killed. So your perhaps your coffee is not tasting uh, like like crabs, but more like chlorine. Uh, in Germany, it's vice versa. No, uh, just kidding. In Germany, the coffee don't taste. Uh, like crabs, but some from time to time you have that in your coffee in the morning. And in this case here, more chlorine, less crabs, more bacteria. That's the difference. But it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem which comes into your house. Don't know how much time we have. We have some minutes left. Uh, I, I like to say, read the rest into in, in the book. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I tell you something about trees. Latest research on trees. Uh, on trees, we don't ask questions. We don't, don't ask questions because they, are, they rank low. Oh, think, of, think of the Neanderthal man and trees, they really rank low. The latest research, and that is really, really um, a good research from uh, an international researcher team from, from the University of Bonn, from Florence, from Perth in Australia. Um, they found out that, that um, plants, that trees can really feel pain. That's a problem for us because we don't like to hear that. Um, they really can feel pain. And now you can say, oh, that's like a fairy tale. No. Um, and pain is not like a reflex. That means when a, when a beetle is stitching uh, or biting into the bark of a tree, and then there's an automatic process going on. No, that's a machine. That's not a living being. And we are away from the machine, as you know. No, they found out that trees are producing pain-suppressing substances. Like we do. Why, why do we uh, uh, produce pain-suppressing substances, do you know? What the reason is? You have all your, your, your own opiates in your body, which can be activated. But when? When do you do that? Pardon? Stress, yeah, for example, when you have an accident. Yeah, when you have an accident and, and your body and your brain uh, wants to be able to react anymore. Because when you have a very strong pain, you, know, you can think nothing else but uh, at the pain. But when uh, you have body-own opiates which suppress the pain, then you have one or two hours more to react, to escape, to whatsoever. And plants uh, do have the same pr uh, um, um, chemicals. And, they, and it's exactly the same reaction. And to prove that, they sedated plants. There was a big interview in the New York Times, and that was uh, how I got this uh, professor. And it's, it's, he is just an hour away from, from my home, and I visited him because we make a um, documentary about the hidden life of trees, and uh, which will be internationally, so you can see it perhaps next year. Um, and we made, made an interview, and, he, and I asked him, uh, do trees feel pain? He said, of course. And they sedated plants with the same um, substances like we uh, we uh, need uh, need them for um, operations, surgeries, uh, and things like that. And plants reacted the same. They they stopped uh, pr produce pain suppressing substances, like we do, because when we are unconscious, we don't need pain suppressing substances, because we don't need to react. Plants are doing the same. Now the next question is. Uh, are plants conscious? Now many people would say, oh, that's too much. And the uh, journalist from the New York Times asked this researcher, this professor, do you think um, that plants are conscious? And he gave the best answer uh, for the actual state. He said, I don't know. That's exactly the point of research we have right now. Let's see what the next years will bring. Thank you. <laughs> And then we have a microphone, yeah. yeah? Yeah, we'll now open it up to questions. This is the question mic. Oh, perhaps we can bring the microphone around. Wouldn't they have to be conscious in order to be able to continue to survive and 
and and not in order to have the will to li- live and procreate, I'm talking about plants or any any an, animal, bes- any living creature. I don't care what it is. You may be right. I don't. I, we don't know so far. That's uh, uh, if if I'm a good scientist, I also uh, only can say I don't know, but I can guess uh, what's going on. I tell you an example. Do you know slime molds? Those yellow mushroom-like uh, beings which are sitting on dead wood. You can you can watch YouTube videos and then uh, researchers put them in labyrinths. And slime molds, uh, they like very much oak flakes. And that are singular cell organisms, I have to say that, singular cell organism. Um, without any brain, without anything like this. Singular cell organisms, and they, they are able to move. If you have a time-lapse function on your, on your um, um, cell phone, you can see it when you will put it near a slime mold for half an hour, you, and, and you watch the video, you can see it moving. And um, the slime mold moves uh, during 25 hours, 24 hours through this labyrinth, and it's able to detect where is the right exit to the oak flakes by try and error. And try and error means you have to remember, ah, that was a mistake, I have to go this way. And so scientists nowadays say that slime molds have a geographic mind. A singular cell organism. So I'm very careful in saying no. I'm not convinced that that plants are conscious. I say I don't know. There's so much to to detect, and if a singular cell organism is able to have a geographic mind, there's a lot of things are possible. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your work. It's fascinating. Thank you. And what I want to talk about are roots, tree roots. Yeah. Very hard to get students to draw tree roots. They'll draw trees, but not the roots. So do you have any advice? Is there anything that helps us understand how the roots grow, why they grow the way they do, whether it's all about reacting to the soil or the other trees? whether they're sort of an ideal form and that's what they're going for, unless there's too more water this way than that way. Um, yeah. Can you just, I didn't get enough that, um, in your tree book about yeah. ro- roots. Um, what, what are, yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Perhaps I'll have to write another tree book, but uh, for sure I will do. <laughs> um, in, the, in the root tips, there are brain-like structures. Charles Darwin um, even mentioned that. Um, but nowadays we have, since let's say 20 years, we have a strong research on, on root tips. And in root tips, there are brain-like structures and brain-like electric process going on. Brain uh, roots are making decisions to go this way, that way. They are able to detect uh, poisonous gases or where they are able to hear where water flow, for example. So uh, the root tips are the main structures of a tree. And perhaps for your students, if I guess right, it's, it's uh, um, good to imagine that trees are standing on their head. And the head is in the in the soil, and 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 the body is, uh, or perhaps just the bureau of the solar cells. The <laughs> stem is outside. Uh, the main part. I'm convinced that the main part of a tree is in the underground, and it's all uh, sometimes much bigger than the tree. For example, what would you guess uh, a tree like this uh, of this size, uh, which which would be the root diameter? Which what would you guess? How, how big the root system is? A tree like this. Yeah, from the crown, yeah. And uh, that's exactly what, what forest students uh, are told in Germany. And, and I always say when we have uh, internships, come out, we go into the forest. Let's, let's tree teach us how big the root system is. And, and then you see that it's, uh, in general, ten, 10 times bigger, the root system. A tree like this, uh, the root system has a diameter of 5 to 10 meters. No, uh, no, no. Uh, it's it's uh, five to ten meters uh, in, in diameter, not not five to ten times, but uh, five to ten meters. And usually, when you plant a tree like this, what is the size of the root ball you get? Like this, yeah. And what does the, does the tree nurseries do? They they prune the root system. Why? Yeah, exactly. To get it in your car. And then you remove all those brain-like structures. And that's not very healthy for a tree. That wouldn't be healthy for us too. So. Uh, the tree is able to recover from that, but not to 100%. For example, trees which have been pruned like that never root deep again. 
They are, they are they all root flat. I don't know if you hear heard about tree species with which root flat. They aren't. There is no no tree species which root flat by nature. They root flat by pruning. And that's, for example, one reason why we don't, in our forest district, we don't plant anything anymore. We just do let, uh, let, let uh, do the job by birds, by seeds, by whatsoever, not to disturb this, this brain system of trees. We know so far that trees are able to remember things. They are able to remember heavy droughts like 2018. And therefore, for the rest of their life, they, they uh, changed their water management. They don't drink as much water as they can in spring to have more for uh, perhaps dry summer, for example. Or um, they are able to, to remember insect attacks. Or we know that apple trees, for example, they are able to count. That's strong research. It sounds like fairy tale, I know. But uh, why do you think that trees don't uh, uh, bloom so early when they have so, uh, warm days in spring, like today? Because they are careful. They say, hmm that's not really spring, perhaps we get a last uh, harsh frost, so we wait. But to wait, you have to remember. And trees, uh, that's proven, they, they can remember, they count the warm days uh, in spring, and just when a, a certain amount is achieved, then they come out with the uh, blossoms. And therefore, you have to have a memory, because otherwise you would count every day one. One, one, and so you, you never... <laughs> that would be stupid, <laughs> right? So they, we don't know where they store it, we don't know that so far, but we know that they are able to count. That's, that's proven. We have another question. <laughs> this is really fascinating. I guess I have two questions. One, um, are you ever criticized for anthropomorphizing? <laughs> that's a hard word, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a good at pronouncing yeah. Asian. Um, but also, what is your thought on the process of bonsai? Because you can take any tree, <laughs> yeah. you can cut its its roots, and you can shape its branches. And what you're implying makes it seem yeah. like maybe this would be perhaps um, harmful or unethical, maybe, even though I think a lot of people who do it are yeah. actually nature lovers. So yeah. two questions. Two questions. Question one. Uh, yeah, the, this uh, critics comes from, uh, in general, from foresters. Yeah, because it's bad for the job uh, to talk about trees like that. Um, the problem is that all our words are, are reserved for humans or perhaps animals, but not for plants. For example, when you're talking about uh, the, the signals in plants, you can't talk about neurobiology. P uh, plant neurobiology neurobi should be the... the uh, the thing, but uh, plants don't have neurons because neurons are specially constructed, so they, you don't find those structures in plants, but they have neuro something like neurotransmitters, but even neurotransmitter you can't use because it's reserved for animals. So uh, that's the problem, but luckily I'm not a scientist, I'm a forester. I'm allowed to cross <laughs> such lines because otherwise you won't understand what's going on. And um, uh, to anthropomorphize things <clears throat> Would, in other words, mean I, I uh, make um, uh, I, I use too much emotions. When when you use uh, scientific papers, there are almost no emotions inside, and that's that's just a, a sort of uh, of language. Um, uh, I I, don't, I think it's, it's it's like a language for elitists, which which no one else could understand. I don't know why it is. It's an agreement, but I don't know if it makes sense. And therefore, more and more um, universities. Um, are going to, to occupy special PR persons which are uh, translating the latest research to lay people because otherwise you won't get money anymore. But no one understands what you're making. And, and it's, it's a pity uh, that, that we have so lovely and good research, but the, the researchers are, are not able to explain it to lay people. And that's my job. I have my own observations. I combine it with research. Uh, we work together with uh, different universities and talk to, uh, look, look what they are doing. We're supporting the research um, monetarily, and uh, then I'm translating this for everyone. And uh, so if some people say, we don't like uh, how you talk about, so I think, okay, there are a lot of other books to buy. Uh, <laughs> it should, must, mustn't be this, this one. <laughs> so that's, and, and the, the second question was on bonsai. Um, I think uh, my personal opinion is I would compare it a little bit uh, to this old Chinese tradition. You know what I mean, with us, uh, where the uh, women get this bondage on their feet. It, yeah, this, 
this is also a cultural thing. And I don't know, uh, perhaps the, the Chinese men love that. The women, I, I think, they, they, they uh, didn't love that. Uh, I would compare it to that. It, the trees look nice, but they suffer, of course, because that is not the natural uh, habit of trees to grow like this. Uh, I won't judge people uh, doing this, because we, there are much worse things to criticize about nature, about trees. That's just a little thing, which is not so important. And for, uh, I tell you another example. When, for example, children are keeping frogs in the house, in the aquarium or wherever, and they love this frog to death, then it's okay for me, because they experience nature. And when they are grown up, uh, they perhaps they protect nature. And therefore, if the life of a frog goes for this, for me, it's okay. It's not okay for everyone. I, I've been criticized for saying that, but uh, I think if you don't experience nature, and even if you're grown up and your experience with nature is a little beech tree in, in, a, in a little pot uh, on your balcony, which suffers perhaps a little bit, uh, and therefore you love beech tree forests and you uh, you um, uh, engage with the protection of tree of, of forests, then it's okay. So I'm not a dogmatist, uh, but you you wanted to have my my opinion on that, and I would compare it to that. <laughs> You said at the near the beginning of your talk, you made a kind of uh, quip about talking to trees, and it seemed as if you were saying you don't talk to trees. And I just wondered about that because I keep having this feeling that trees are talking to me, and I talk back sometimes. And I wonder, I, I don't this, and I get some flack from when I say that, and maybe I will tonight, but. But it feels real to me, and so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, not necessarily, you know, this yeah. kind of talk, but there is a communication. So, um, yeah, uh, I have to uh, reflect on how I was educated to come to to come to this. I'm I'm always uh, based on strong conservative science. Let us say like this. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that's that's the answer. And uh, you know that I know that conservative science is not always right. But that's what I'm based on. Uh, I would say um, there, even on conservative science, there is um, we can measure reactions. For example, when you're in a forest and the forest is intact, there's, a, there's communications uh, between the trees on chemical ways, for example, when they warn each other from insect attacks and whatsoever. And in a, in a healthy forest, you have just good vibrations, let's say like this, there's no warning, chemical warning uh, cries whatsoever. So um, uh, our blood pressure sinks, that's strongly proven. Meanwhile, many countries start uh, health programs on this Shinryoku, which comes from Japan, uh, which which uh, some people laugh about uh, 10 years ago nowadays uh, you, you it's uh, integrated into healthcare to go out in the forest and to calm down to get your blood pressure down to get your your um, system better and uh, so that's a reaction on tree communication so if you have a sense for that that's good most people just say when they come in the forest uh, you that's unconscious communication uh, and it comes to consciousness for you uh, just in saying, ah, it's a nice spot here. Huh? I feel well. It's a nice forest. And, you, and unconscious, your body say, yeah, that's, that's the best place to be because it's a stable forest. It's a healthy environment here. Because, uh, on the other hand, when you're in a plantation, a conifer plantation, for example, which is, which is in danger to be... Uh, to be um, uh, um, e uh, eaten by by bugs or uh, to be destroyed by a, w a wildfire. Th that's that's the main problem that we have on the, on the west coast at the moment. That that's not because of the climate changes, but it's because of forestry, because of all this plantation that are no real forest anymore. And uh, in in this uh, conifer plantation, for example, your blood pressure rises. I've proven proven that myself uh, with a. a um, TV moderator uh, on a TV show, and that works really good <laughs> when, you, when you measure the blood pressure. That's really surprising when you do. So there, there is um, there is something like a communication, but but um, trees are also on an electric uh, way. They they have also electrical signals in their body, and they are very slow. They're as much as ten ti thousand times slower than our body signals. Ten thousand times slow, and if you expect an electrical answer you have to wait many hours 
So, but what, which is not bad because you have to take your time, you calm down, that's always very healthy. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Hi. I read your book and uh, I have to read it at least a couple more times to mm. grasp it. Um, that lady it talked about uh, language and, and you talked about yeah. it. We, we don't have the right language. You talk maybe about animals and human beings. So I think, well, maybe there is language, but not the known languages in the Western world. Uh, we know that Eskimos have a lot of different uh, expressions for white and Native Americans for green and different plants. So I thought, like, why not doing research on languages that maybe not scientific in the contemporary sense, but very related to what you yeah. do research on. Yeah, So right. that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you for uh, for your words. Um, perhaps I I give you a little thing from my latest book, which is not on the German market so far. Uh, it's not published because the manuscript is, is uh, was finished just two weeks ago. But I, I give you a little thing out of this uh, latest book. It's it's on the relationship human nature and if we if our senses are degenerated if if the the connection between nature and us has been destroyed which is nonsense there are strong proofs for that but uh, just a little thing out of this new book uh, because of the language um, to see blue is a cult cultural thing 1000 years ago our ancestors from the from the western hemisphere didn't have a word for blue 1,000 years ago, and we can't see blue. There's a little test in the internet. You can see that, that um, for example, the, uh, the, the Himba in Namibia, for example, they also don't have a word for blue. They are not able to see blue. And there's a ring of, of uh, I think, around about 15 dots in, in green, and one is blue. And they are not able to detect which one is the blue, because they don't have a word for blue. And on the other hand, there's a, there's a, on the other side, there's also a ring with green dots, and one is a little bit more yellow, just a little bit. We are not able to detect it, but the Himba has so many have, have so many words for green. They instantly see this one dot which, which differs. It's, it's in test on the internet. You can see that. So blue to see blue is a cultural thing. It's just a question of language. You would say blue. Everyone can see, see blue. That's scientific proven. No, it isn't. Two thousand years ago. Our ancestors are, were not able to see blue except Egyptians because they used lapis lazuli for coloring things. You can see it on the old pictures. They, they could see blue, but, but for example, not the old Germans or Romans or so. They couldn't see blue. That's a cultural thing. So thank you for your, for your info for, uh, for on the language. Yeah, yeah, I, I love blue. I say, I, who, who. In, when, you, when you read this old uh, Greek um, tales, for example, from Homer, he said, the ocean is the color of wine. Huh? <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't know blue. Okay. There's one other, I think, the last question. Or do you also have a question? <laughs> okay. I'm just curious now for the, I'm just curious now for the for the people that couldn't see blue when, when they looked at what we would see as blue. What color did they think that they were seeing? A sort of green. A sort Soft of green, green or a sort of red, hmm. yeah. And when you look at the sky, in, in general, most times it is blue, I would say, and, and so is the ocean. But uh, I would say, yeah, like you, I would say, huh? how couldn't you see blue? But it's really a cultural phenomena. Well, that's proven. You can make this little test on the internet, um, and then you see there are still people on this planet which can see blue. So the last question to you. Um, so I'm really interested in the language that you use on all three of your books. In the first, you use the word hidden. In the second, you were, use the word inner. In the third, you use secret. Um, there seems to be something that you're picking up on that I'm really interested in, and I really <laughs> appreciate the work that you're doing, um, that uh, nature seems to be very interested in hiding itself um, from us or um, maybe even from itself, um, there, there seems to be a, a, a single thread uh, in all of our intelligence mm -hmm. that relates to um, codifying our information. Um, and in nature, in, in my mind, it seems um, because the, the future of our life is not really about um, us, it's about what comes after us. And um, I'm interested in 
your use of the uh, um, these kind of you know mysteries or these kind of hidden mysterious places and why why you might think that is uh, so the general question is why I think all those things are hidden f f uh, for us. Um, I think it's just because we 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 don't look so carefully in the moment, and that's uh, you're right. It's a question of language. Uh, when we when we, for example, when we say nature is a machinery, when we say a tree is a machine, we don't ask questions. For example, when we say uh, we 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 think that all species are servants to us. The main questions that I got on forests and trees is, what do they do for us? They produce timber, they produce oxygen, they, produ they purify water. No. If you could ask a tree, you would say, I do what? <laughs> huh? <laughs> huh? Who, you, who are you? You're just there since 300,000 years. We are there since uh, 300 million years. We have even just recognized that you are there. So uh, it's, it's a human-centrified uh, word or view or on, the, on the world, and uh, which is which is not really uh, comfortable for us because we are so interconnected with all things and it's, it's so, um, you could enjoy nature much more if you regard is it not as a machine but uh, is, uh, as uh, if, uh, companions. Yeah, and uh, it's so it's it's much nicer and you, have, you enjoy nature much more when you see how it is in reality. So uh, that's exactly what, what the next book is on, uh, that we are best connected to nature. For example, Another thing from the book, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell that, <laughs> because otherwise you won't buy it. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, many people think that our nose is much worse than a dog's nose. Yeah, some a thousand times, a million times worse in, in many smells. In some smells, right, but in others, we are better than dogs. For example, dogs are not able to smell fruits very good. We are much better in smelling fruits uh, than dogs. Yeah. So it seems logical because dogs are not very interested in fruits. So um, uh, that you can you can uh, see, it, for example, uh, how you how you can feel with your fingers. There are many interesting things uh, to detect. Why do you uh, bring your your hand to your uh, chin? Why do we know? There's new research. Why if we don't ask questions? Most people, even <laughs> like you, you do it like this. Why? It's 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 a human reaction. It is very very intelligent to do though, because uh, you um, uh, with this gesture you made your your brain waves uh, even, and you can concentrate better when you have uh, influence from outside sound or other people, and you're not able to concentrate. You touch your your head, you touch your skin, and then your 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 hastily brain waves. Calm, calm down and you can concentrate much better. Yeah, but we, we don't ask questions. And that's part, it, it sounds strange, but even that is part of nature. So uh, the, that's, that's perhaps, it's a, I don't know what, what, when you have a trilogy, what, what's the fourth book then? It's a, it's a quadrology, I don't know. <laughs> so because uh, the, the missing link are, are uh, we. we. In this, in this part. We are part of nature, we are still integrated, we are still able to feel, and as you say, trees have an impact on you and you feel uh, what, what's going on. Uh, we are able to detect many, many things when we are out, outside, and at last, uh, to close this for today, but I want, want you to, um, to tell what the difference uh, is in enjoying nature and going out in the forest. In general, when you go out in the forest, you plan your walk. You say, ah, today, I am going to start at 9 a.m. And then I go out in the forest, let's say, for an, a walk 10 miles or so. Then I make uh, going into this restaurant or I eat something whatsoever, and then I'm back at the parking at 4 p.m. So when you are back, your friends are, uh, when you tell your friends where I've been, they, they ask, at minimum to me, how much miles did you make? That's, that's the, the typical question. And they don't ask, did you enjoy it? Uh, and to go out in the forest means go out in the forest. And when you when you just 100 yards in the forest, you can stay the whole day. And and when the sun sets, you go back. But who? Uh, I don't know when, uh, many people who who do so, because it seems so lazy. Yeah. And when you're in your everyday life, uh, and then and, you, and at the weekend you are not able to relax. You have your schedule, and you walk through the forest. And afterwards, you have seen nothing but just just green furniture. Therefore, I encourage everyone, 
Go out, enjoy, and it's much better um, uh, when you know what's going on. When you know what trees are doing, and trees are so slow, take your time, because otherwise you won't recognize everything. No? Yeah, right? <laughs> so, um, and then you feel more interconnected, and then uh, you are better in protecting nature. I gave an interview to the McLean's uh, magazine in Canada. They shortened it a little bit too much. I always say, uh, when you want to pr protect nature, keep your hands in the pocket. Don't do anything. I don't mean uh, do nothing against climate change. Not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, um, uh, aiming at that. No, but don't do anything in nature. Don't try to manage nature. Don't try to do whatsoever. Keep your hands in your pockets, calm down, and then you're the best friends of trees whatsoever. Thank you. <laughs>